courage. It smells of 10,000 restaurants, 5,000 temples, shrines, churches and mosques, and of a hundred bazaars devoted exclusively to perfumes, spices, incense and freshly cut flowers. Gala once called it the worst good smell in the world, and she was right, of course, in that way she had of being right about things. But whenever I return to Bombay now, it's my first sense of the city, that smell above all things, that welcomes me and tells me I've come home. The next thing I noticed was the heat. I stood in airport queues, not five minutes from the conditioned air of the plane, and my clothes clung to sudden sweat. My heart thumped under the command of the new climate. Each breath was an angry little victory. I came to know that it never stops, the jungle sweat, because the heat that makes it, night and day, is a wet heat. The choking humidity makes amphibians of us all in Bombay. Breathing water in air, you learn to live with it, and you learn to like it, or you leave. Then there were the people, Assamese, Jats and Punjabis, people from Rajasthan, Bengal and Tamil Nadu, from Pushkar, Cochin and Konarak, warrior caste, Brahmin and untouchable, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, Parsi, Jain, animist, fair skin and dark, green eyes and golden brown and black, every different face and form of that extravagant variety, that incomparable beauty, India. All the Bombay millions, and then one more. The two best friends of the smuggler are the mule and the camel. Mules carry contraband across a border control for a smuggler. Camels are unsuspecting tourists who help the smuggler to get across the border. To camouflage themselves when using false passports and identification papers, smugglers insinuate themselves into the company of fellow travellers. Camels who'll carry them safely and unobtrusively through airport or border controls without realising it. I didn't know all that then. I learned the smuggling arts much later, years later. On that first trip to India, I was just working on instinct, and the only commodity I was smuggling was myself, my fragile and hunted freedom. I was using a false New Zealand passport, with my photograph substituted in it for the original. I'd done the work myself, and it wasn't a perfect job. I was sure it would pass a routine examination, but I knew that if suspicions were aroused and someone checked with the New Zealand High Commission, it would be exposed as a forgery fairly quickly. On the journey to India from Auckland, I'd roamed the plain in search of the right group of New Zealanders. I found a small party of students who were making their second trip to the subcontinent. Urging them to share their experience and traveller's tips with me, I fostered a slender acquaintance with them that brought us to the airport controls together. The various Indian officials assumed that I was travelling with that relaxed and guileless group and gave me no more than a cursory check. I pushed through alone to the slap and sting of sunlight outside the airport intoxicated with the exhilaration of escape. Another wall scaled, another border crossed, another day and night to run and hide. I'd escaped from prison almost two years before, but the fact of the fugitive life is that you have to keep on escaping, every day and every night. And while not completely free, never completely free, there was hope and fearful excitement in the new a new passport, a new country, and new lines of excited dread on my young face under the grey eyes. I stood there on the trampled street, beneath the baked blue bowl of Bombay sky, and my heart was as clean and hungry for promises as a monsoon morning in the gardens of Malabar. Sir! Sir! a voice called from behind me. A hand grabbed at my arm. I stopped. I tensed every fighting muscle and bit down on the fear. Don't run. Don't panic. I turned.